Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we are here to discuss a very important topic today, and that's the future of work. And we have a catchy title, and that's whether the future of work is going to be workless or if we're going to work less. Uh, I'm Carmen, and I'm joined today by Nikos on stage to discuss what we really believe is one of the most uh, important topics of our days. So I want to make a disclaimer before we start that we are not uh, experts in employment. We are not government agents. Uh, we don't know uh, the legalities of it or uh, you know the regulations. What we do know is that uh, there is a, a technological revolution that's going on at the moment, and it's going to change, it's going to make a lot of jobs obsolete in the, in the in very, very near future, actually. Uh, and we can just make logical s conclusions from accepting that fact that we want to discuss with you today. We do get a front seat at what's happening, though, because both uh, you and I, every day, we, we work to automate a few tasks, so we kind of understand what's happening. But I think predicting the future is quite difficult, because we're at the tipping point. We are at the point where we can create the future, in a way. Uh, so I think the objective for today would, ha would be to have a constructive conversation uh, around how the future of work can uh, look like. Great, and I, I'd like to just second on that. Uh, we, we get exposed, because we work in startups, we get exposed to new business models that are being enabled by technology. Uh, and what's coming is going to be a tsunami. We have to... Um, to this, I think a good way to start is to ask ourselves why now? Why should we discuss this now? Why is it relevant? That, that's a very good question. Actually, uh, the, um, this question uh, of let's say robots taking over our lives and our jobs, uh, has been around for many, many years. I was, when I was growing up uh, back in the very distant 80s, uh, I remember distinctly a classroom discussion uh, where the, the, the students and the teacher were discussing about this exact uh, topic. And, and the conclusion we made then was that, okay, robots should make some things, but then somebody has to make the robots. So, uh, you know, society would find ways to replace this, uh, these jobs. Um, but uh, right now, I think the uh, speed of change is so significant that society will not be able to adapt uh, so quickly. We're not going to be able to regenerate jobs in the, in the, in the pace that are going to be lost. Uh, and the reason for that is that we have, as Carmen said, reached a tipping point. The, the processing speeds are, are so, so fast at the moment. And that enables so many different business models to um, um, come up and, and, you know, entrepreneurs uh, devise them. They get a lot of funding uh, uh, for this. So, uh, and there's thousands and thousands of um, uh, businesses that are now being developed that will change the world. So what happened basically? <coughs> The way I'm thinking of this, and I'm trying to simplify, right? Um, we started by inventing a steam engine, then came uh, assembly lines, then came electricity, uh, then came computerization, digitalization, platformization. And the question is, where are we now and what's next? Um, some people call it the fourth industrial revolution. Some people call it industry 4.0. But I, I think whatever name we're going to find for it, uh, the most important thing is that's already impacting work as we know it. Uh, I think it's, that's only going to accelerate in the future. Um, and by the way, I'm, I'm, think, I'm seeing this everywhere. Everywhere. Uh, we just 3D printed the first building. Um, uh, we, we, we are now uh, producing shoes in, in something we call speed factories. So what that means is that we are using robots that in 10 minutes are able to produce a pair of shoes for me that's fully customized, so I can choose to have a pink line on it if I want it. Uh, and then what about traditional industries? That's happening as well. We are extracting oil at, at, at the moment by controlling it as humans from a control room while the machines are doing the work. So it's kind of everywhere. Yeah, I agree. And uh, I want to make a, a, a distinction here, Carmen. Uh, the, the, the difference now is that uh, computers are taking over what we do. So let's take uh, the car example. Uh, and, and, you know, we heard about driverless cars, and those of you who were at uh, the main stage earlier, you heard about the future of driverless cars. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, uh, w you know, cars replaced carriages as a um, uh, medium to get us from place A to place B. Uh, and then maps came up because we needed to understand, you know, know how to get from one place to the other. And then the maps became digital maps, and now we have Google Maps. And we have 
uh, this great feature that you know you, you can tell the traffic as well uh, on, on Google Maps. So uh, all these are tools. They are tools that help us get from place A to place B faster by driving the car. But the driverless car is actually replacing us. It's replacing you and me uh, mm -hmm. as drivers. We won't drive cars in the future. It replaces also everybody who works in transportation, from taxi drivers, truck drivers, truck drivers couriers, yeah. um, and uh, food delivery. Uh, and it's about cars now, but in the future it could be about ships and planes. All these people would find themselves in front of a reality where their job is not there anymore. Do you think this is going to come to Greece uh, anytime soon? Yeah, or? that's an excellent question. You know, I, I, I keep hearing this uh, uh, thing that Greece is so backward that, uh, uh, you know, things will never come here. And actually, uh, just yesterday, there's a hundred countries in, in the world that were being uh, attacked by a cyber attack. Uh, and Greece was not one of them. And, and you'd think, of course, I mean, there's nothing to attack in Greece. <laughs> uh, but the uh, the truth is that these people, that uh, th th these technologies are being adopted by uh, normal people like you and me and everybody else in this room. And in that respect, uh, we are ahead of the curve. We are one of the fastest um, countries in adopting new technologies. And I'm telling you, when these business models start making uh, taking shape elsewhere in the world, they will come to Greece quite fast. There's no way you can escape this, that's how I think. But the human element is also important. We haven't, we haven't touched on it yet. Because people now feel vulnerable. They feel le left out. There's fear. And I think it's only normal to, ha to have fear. Uh, that's also because politicians are reluctant to go out there and transmit a message that sounds like um, the future of work is not what you expect. So all these jobs that you think are coming are not going to come, actually. Uh, so it's very important to have a frank, honest conversation about the lack of preparedness that's in the world to, to, face, with this, uh, to face this issue. And I think the fact that we as entrepreneurs are taking that stand, uh, it's a good thing, and we hope everyone is, is going to be exposed to, to this. And I just want to make another point about Greece. You know, we have 30% unemployment already in Greece. Uh, and we are struggling to get out of this crisis with a 30% unemployment. And we might see that we find ourselves, the moment we manage to sort of uh, escape uh, in front of this other crisis, it's not going to be caused by debt, but it's going to be caused by technology. So that's a, that's a key thought to be uh, had, especially if you're Greek. Which is embrace the change. Uh, which is embrace the change to, you know, uh, for a future, otherwise you're just going to find yourself in the wrong side of, the, of history, basically. So, um, what's this is, what, what, what do you think, Carmen? How do you think this will play out? I mean, I, I, I think so far we have said that this is coming, and it's coming really fast, and the reason it's coming really fast is because technology is moving, at a, it has enabled a lot of new business models to be developed, uh, and that we've said that this might lead to mass unemployment, but, you know, what will happen? Let's talk about some thoughts about what will happen. The way I'm thinking about this, I always start with the question, what is the purpose behind all this? I think it's the right question to start with. What is the purpose behind uh, building a car that can drive from point A to point B without us humans being involved? What is the purpose of building an AI that can shoulder 60% of the work that I'm currently doing every day? What's the purpose of that? And then to answer these questions, I think we have two options. One of them, are we building this technology so that we can work even more hours for less pay? Or are we building this technology so that we can reinvent the way we live and the way we work and build an alternative future? And I would argue for the second. And I think that's a very important point to make. Actually, I, I disagree. I, I think uh, these models are being developed for people and companies to make more money. I mean, the, the main motivation is money. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But the fact that we have a model that works, that opens new opportunities, is incredibly important to understand. So the fact that we have now 4 billion people on the internet, with billions coming in the next decades, the fact that we have 2 billion people on Facebook, that we've got people using platforms and being connected all the time, opens doors to a new future. I agree but uh, that that could be the case. But actually, I don't think people like to share. 
So uh, let's go back to Greece. We have 30% unemployment here, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, those of us who are employed uh, work 12 to 14 hours a day. So why don't we just give up like 30, 40% of our pay and work 40% less hours and then we can have a work-life balance? Because there's no such an option. Do you, do you think people wouldn't do it if this option was available? Because I'm not sure. Because we don't have an option that tells me that if I give 30% of the pay, and by the way, this also makes a point that money is the only way we can create uh, value in the economy, so maybe that's not the case, another question. But I don't have this alternative, but I think we could. We could build this alternative where... Um, Basically, we orchestrate, uh, we orchestrate global workforce in a way that creates value more efficiently. Carmen. And we've done this. We've done this. By the way, we've got platforms now uh, where all of us are freelancers, all of us are contributors. We can just expand on that model, bring it maybe at the state level, bring it at the regional level, and make sure all of us contribute. All, all of that is about making money, though. Everything is around making money. All these platforms, from uh, you know the sharing platforms to the freelancers platforms. And it's about creating value at the same time. Y yes, I agree. But you know, l look at what's happening in the world. It's it's going entirely the, the, the other way. I mean, people are, are closing the borders. They're voting to leave the European Union. They want to build the Mexico Wall. Uh, they uh, vote 35 percent for isolationism in France. Uh, and these people are people who have jobs. The jobs are not paying them what they like to well, be paid. Uh, but what happens when they lose their jobs? I think what happens is that they'll vote for populist leaders that will tell them that they can magically bring jobs back. Take what you're saying is that if we continue doing what we're doing, or if we continue doing things the way we've done them in the past, this is the future we have ahead of us. And I'll tell you how I see this future. I see a future of great divide. Uh, a future where access is for the select few, a future of uh, major income gaps, and that's a future I don't want. But I, I agree I, I, with you yeah. that if we continue doing things the way we've done them in the past, that's where we're going. So let's avoid that and think of how can we do things differently. Uh, okay, I can agree to that point. However, uh, you know, this technology is a weapon. These technologies are, are a weapon for companies and for people to dominate over others. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just think it's part of human nature to go against that. You have like cases like Obamacare in the States where people are anxious to repeal it so that they can deny uh, access to healthcare to uh, their fellow citizens. I just don't see the same uh, thing happening. I understand that it could be enabled by platforms, but I just think that even if platforms are there, humans will not uh, uh, use them in the way you to imagine. So here's the question. The question is, do we want to live in a world where half percent of the population is uh, starving, for example? And do we want this as an option at the point where we are actually producing enough food to feed everyone on planet Earth? Because I think everyone should answer this question with a radical no. And then what, what do we do about it? One, we can use technology to create this abundance, to create surplus, uh, and then we can use again technology uh, to distribute it equally and make sure that everybody has a, a good quality of life. And I think this is the challenge, this is the, the, the future we want to go towards. You were talking about universal basic income and that sort of thing? We already have good models around this, which gets me excited. So we are talking about a 15-hour work week which would mean that all of us are contribute to, to, to the global economy in a very well orchestrated and efficient way. And then we've got the model of a universal basic income. Um, and I think these are good ideas to, to keep exploring. Okay, let's take the 15 minutes. Also, okay, let's sorry. take the alternative, because the alternative is terrible. We've got people aging, we've got more people entering the workforce, and none of the other scenarios are even realistic. What are you going to tell me, that people are going to work until they are 70? Or are you going to tell me that through continuous lifelong learning, we're going to be able to bring those people back in the economy in their 50s? I think that's not an option, so we should stop considering it as an option and explore what else is out there. And I think these models have higher potential of, of allowing us to build a better reality. Yeah, um, I have a question on the 15-hour work week. Um, <laughs> what are we going to do with our lives? Because, you know, the way I see it, 
is that humans are not equipped to, they, they need a sense of purpose. We need a, you know, we go to work because we need a sense of purpose. We work for that. And uh, if we don't have that sense of purpose, I think what we're going to find ourselves is um, emerged in uh, virtual reality games like the ones in the, in the back there uh, for like half the day and it's going to be virtual, then mixed, then augmented, and you know, wh who knows what will happen in these environment, environments. Drugs could play uh, um, a role um, when they're legalized, as they're now starting to be. Uh, so I don't know if this is a future that we want anyway Perhaps a sense of purpose is something that people need. All of these things are going to be out there, and this covers our need for entertainment. But at the same time, we're going to need to learn how, how to live again. And, well, and that, that's a very good question, and I usually address it with a quote that I like very much. What if, in the future, work's going to be for robots and life's going to be for people? So I really like that, and get, gets me thinking. There are so many things we can bring in our lives. Continuous learning, uh, emerging into better, better ways, find better ways to contribute to the society. Having entertainment out, out there is going to be fine, and we already have it. But I think with a new time that we're going to have available, we're going to learn to contribute in new ways. And that gets me really excited. I think, it, I think it's a nice alternative to have. What are we going to do with all this time? So, Carmen, I agree with you. I like the, the way you, um, you, 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 your future, the future that you're painting. I, I don't actually believe that it's that uh, uh, plausible to get don't, to don't, there. Don't be cynical about it, because, because the alternative is worse. If we continue imagining the future like it's going to be, the, like, like, like it's the past, um, there are no exciting things out there. It's like, I would say I'm going to live my life tomorrow exactly like I've lived yesterday. And that's not only boring, it's very limiting for my life. So I want us to start thinking about the big problems we have ahead of us in the same way. We've lived through the past, let's learn from the past, if that's the case, but let's imagine the future differently. It takes a, a, a new generation of people to get that done. And because you are in the newer generation than I am, what are the, some of the concrete things that we, we could do to get there? Look, this is a complex issue and can do many things. But, but I think we could start experimenting uh, right now. Here's something that comes to mind. Let's take a small community. Let's take a village. Let's take a small town. Let's put that all online. Let's build a platform where all citizens can connect. Let's uh, give them access to the best education out there through this platform. Let's uh, have them civically engaged so that they can vote, so that they can communicate to their leaders in the community, this is what I want to see, this is how I want to spend my money. Uh, and at the same time, there's transparency within the community. Uh, I want to. I, I want to uh, be able to to understand what my political leaders are doing, what decisions they are making on my behalf, how are they spending money, and that's possible. That's an experiment that we can do tomorrow. Actually, I like that because that actually, in order for that to happen, we need entrepreneurs to to make that happen. And I think uh, in the next century or so. I don't know, let's not put a time limit because it may be longer, it may be shorter, but in the next period of time, it's entrepreneurs that are going to change the world. And, uh, you know, if every person who's thinking about a business idea can think about it in the light of them uh, uh, making money or becoming famous or whatever drives them as entrepreneurs, but also as something that would benefit society and would take a step for society towards the future that you're describing, or maybe a different alternative future that is better and still much better than, than the uh, doom scenario that I was advocating is more likely, then we could um, reach a much better conclusion than uh, w w what you know the doom scenario. And let just, let, let, let's just say about the doom scenario, I want to just uh, focus your mind and you know, the mind of the people here. It's about war. What's going to happen if people lose their jobs and, you know, uh, they, they don't have, they're not taken care of, is that they're, they're going to find ways to redistribute income in a violent way, even if um, violence is sort of eradicated in our... This is... I think we have a choice here, and the choice is whether we're going to look at this future with hope or with fear. Um, I personally choose to look at the future with hope, 
and I urge everyone to do the same thing. But I, I urge everyone to do the same thing with and while trying to build a vision, also use reason, because we've got tools in our hands that can help us avoid the terrible scenario you're describing. And it's going to take everyone, everyone out there to get involved. The good news, <laughs> I've got good news. And the good news is that we've done this in the past. For example, we've changed our perspective around violence. That's a great success for humanity. Because, well, hundreds of years ago, we were very comfortable fighting each other so that I can get food and you won't. Uh, now we're not thinking like that anymore. Uh, we're very empathic about fellow uh, people all over the world. We do not want war. The thought of violence, uh, it's unacceptable for most of us. So we've managed to change perspective about really important things. Why don't we do that as well about how the future is going to look like? Actually, uh, a lot of how we've eradicated violence is about fiction, and I'm 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 a fan of fiction, because what I think people should do uh, is that we should start talking with each other, talking with each other, talk with our leaders, talk with our business leaders, but for, foremost, talk with each other, and understand that this is coming. If we don't talk about it, then we're just going to find ourselves in the future that we don't want to, and you know. One of the problems, which was addressed also earlier in the main stage, is that people are unaware that this is coming. And one way to make them aware that this is coming is through, is through fiction, you know, um, uh, showing them, you know, a, a pleasant way, let's say, because there's a lot of non-fiction books about what we've dis we're discussing, but nobody's going to read them, for, you know, uh, but the fiction books or the movies uh, do that quite well. So I think that would be... a another way we could reach your, what how did you call it uh, yeah i'm going to use this exam i'm going to i'm going to take your your story around fiction and build my own fiction if i'm going to choose my fiction that's going to be the, the future of work is going to be for robots and life's going to be for humans thank you very much